No, um, I didn't say it. I said. <laughs> I've often wondered what it would be like to start a talk on UFOs and say, UFOs are a very interesting subject. Are there any questions? And this is one time I think I can do it because, for one thing, we don't have the projector set up yet. And so there's microphone number one over there and microphone number two over there. They are more or less permanently installed. And I would suggest that people who want to ask questions as, uh, uh, as conveniently as possible line up at the closest thing. Uh, that'll save me the trouble. In cases where you're really clogged in and easily get out, then say your question as loudly as possible, and if necessary, I'll repeat the question. Uh, all right, let's start with you then. Did, uh, do I, should I repeat the question? Did most of you hear it? Heard it, good. That, you're referring to Mrs. Lorenzen, Cora Lorenzen, the APRO organization that traced this uh, case in Ubatuba, Brazil. The story is that uh, one of the natives saw a UFO come crashing down and in the shallow water at the side of the lake, some of the pieces of it were recovered and when the pieces that came back to the United States were analyzed, they were indeed very purity magnesium. The significance ascribed to that was that we didn't know how, our technology didn't know how to make magnesium that perfect, that pure. But it's turned out that that isn't quite the case. The Dow Chemical people later, see this, anybody know when the Ubatuba was, was it 1952? 54. Uh, certainly by 1960, I believe, the uh, Dow Chemical was turning out magnesium of that purity. Uh, now, if that really was a part of it and was not planted later and really was found in 1954 or whenever it was, significance because it would indicate that here was something that was elsewhere. However, the Condon Committee looked at that and found that uh, while it was quite pure, it compared favorably with the, um, the Dow chemical. However, APRO then pointed out, and I think correctly, that um, uh, the impurities in the Ubatuba sample and the impurities in the Dow chemical were not the same. I don't really know what significance to ascribe to that, um, that seems to me down to the hair splitting stage. I think the real issue is was this sample planted later or was it the original thing? The thing, then I think it would have occurred at a time before the United States at least um, was producing magnesium in that purity. And of course the significance of that would be that it would have had to have come from someplace else. Um, now let's see who's at the anyone at the mic. Let's try microphone two. Uh, let's try. Uh, well, I'll just I'll just shout. All right, that's a good Is it idea. On? <laughs> yeah. Recently, I saw on front page Challenge a man was interviewed uh, in the state somewhere. It had happened. He'd been kidnapped by a flying saucer for about a week, and he had five companions. And the police were holding them or questioning them pretty. Uh, quite a while and uh, up again. Now the, the panelists on front page challenge kind of poked fun at him. They didn't believe the story. And I wonder, I think you know the situation. I just forget the man's name. Could you tell me the latest developments on that case? Yeah, that, uh, that is the famous case of Travis Walton. Uh, the story is a very interesting one. Uh, Travis was a part of a team of six or young men who were I had a job of trimming trees in the Apache National Forest in Arizona. And on the way home one day, 
uh, at about dusk, as they rounded a bend in the road, there in front of them was the typical flying saucer. Uh, by typical there, I mean it was a lighted craft. Uh, I don't have a drawing. Sort of uh, cigar-shaped in a way with the ends cut off and a series of windows and lights. Um, they stopped the car and one of them, Travis Walton, rushed out for no apparent reason except he was very curious, rushed out to um, see what it was. At that time, the report goes that a knight came down from the object and zapped him and he just fell on the ground. The others panicked and beat it. But their consciences hurt them, I guess, inside of two or three minutes, and they turned around and came back, and both the craft and Travis Walton were gone. Now, uh, five days later, Walton was found in a telephone booth about 12 miles farther down the road, in a very disheveled state. Uh, in, I have tried to get in touch with Travis Walton, and for some strange reasons, uh, I've not been permitted to uh, get in touch with him, which of course, immediately throws some suspicion on it. But at least I think it would, because uh, I wanted to go down there and talk to him and uh, help authenticate it if it were true. However, be that as it may, I think the story divides itself very definitely in two parts. The five original witnesses who did not get out of the car uh, took lie detector tests and passed them. The, um, furthermore, the sighting is typical of the sightings uh, that, uh, of, that, of that kind. It's a close encounter of the, as far as that goes, a close encounter of the first kind, where something is quite close, but nothing really happens. Now, if you, uh, uh, the other part is, is separate for the moment. So I definitely feel, well, I have no reason to doubt that. After all, a uh, qualified person administered the lie detector test, the Five young men are all healthy, strapping men and uh, have had no reason for concocting a story like that. The Travis Walton abduction case, he says that he was taken aboard, given medical tests, and uh, then deposited back five days later. Uh, this, this then becomes a one witness case. Now, the last I heard, he had not taken a lie detector test. Um, but I'm going to be in Phoenix, Arizona, where this all happened, on next month, uh, on another mission. And I'm, once again, I'm going to try to get in touch with Travis and find out. If, if he still refuses to see me, then I, I have no recourse but to say that I cannot believe his story. Uh, any next question? Okay, let's see, way, at the, way near the door. And real loud, please. Well, the Blue Book files are going to be released next month in microfilm form. If you want them, the microfilms will cost $15,000. Uh, the uh, the uh, Center for UFO Studies will, however, manage to get a copy, I'm happy to say. Now, um, the, uh, the, the rest of the situation of releasing things, there was r rumors that the U.S. government was relaxing and letting things leak out. Well, in a sense, that is true. For instance, when the... Uh, when the motion picture or the, um, the TV documentary UFOs Past, Present, and Future was made, um, they allowed filming at Hallman Air Force Base, uh, which uh, ordinarily wouldn't have been done. They allowed the film crew, and I happen to know this because my son was a member of the film crew, uh, uh, they, um, they sort of gave him the red carpet treatment, which was unusual, really. However, as far as any real disclosures, like now it can all be told, I don't think so. Uh, let's try this. How, is that mic working or? We're having fun with it anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Uh, I
I'd like to start, I think, with slide number 65 there. <laughs> Um, the number happens to be just by chance. Uh, something that something I didn't get a chance to talk about this afternoon, the um, general problem of life elsewhere in the universe. And here I can speak, I think, we can, go, can we go one back of this thing? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea to have some lights on, a little dim anyway. Uh, this is not a course in astronomy, but I think because we, we have here a very real interesting situation. The astronomers on one hand are quite prepared to say that uh, there's no question at all why life shouldn't exist in the universe. And then the UFO uh, people will very frequently say, aha, uh -huh, that proves it. That's what UFOs are. They're visitors from elsewhere. I want to examine that sort of conflict there. Um, I think all of you know that the sun is one star out of about 200 billion stars. And it's in a collection of stars called our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And the lower part here would indicate the, the, the sun and its contingent of planets going around it. Now the planets are very much like in a sense, like insects buzzing. What, what is this? The rest, of the, the rest of the carves me apart. I guess the other direction. Point to that direction. Maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe it's too. Maybe that's the oh. one. Yeah. Yeah, I think this one simply tells you that it's on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my lead BVDs on. Um, now, uh, the, the planets are like, really can be compared to insects buzzing around an airport beacon. And but it'd be pretty hard to discover. Now, the sun is one star in a whole bunch of other stars. And this would be our particular neighborhood in the galaxy. The whole galaxy is... Uh, turning, it's in a spiral form, our particular one is, and the sun is far from being the center, it's out in the suburbs, you might say, and the whole thing is turning around, and although you think you're sitting still at the moment, you're actually being carried along with the sun at a speed of 150 miles a second, plus or minus, around this whole thing, and yet this whole thing is so large that it takes the sun 200 million years to make one round trip. Now, there are a collection of 200 billion stars in this system. This is merely one of about 10 billion other set systems, each containing billions of stars. It so turns out that if, um, when that bores a hole through the wall, we'll know it's been on enough. Um, now, let me put it in this in this manner. Uh, today, with the largest world's largest telescopes, if a person well, you know, when you were in school, your teacher undoubtedly put an orange on the table to represent the sun, and then a little way, about a foot away or so, something tiny to represent the Earth. You might have wondered at that time how large a schoolroom would you have to have to represent everything that the astronomer can see through the world's great telescopes. Well. I made that calculation some time ago, and it was rather surprising. If you do that, and if you make your model not equal to a large hall or a large schoolroom, but suppose you made that model as large as Canada itself, that would sort of place you someplace in the middle of Manitoba, and Vancouver would represent as far out as the astronomer can see in one direction, and Halifax, say, would represent as far out as the astronomer can see in the other direction. Now, if you made such a model, then on that model, to that scale, the Earth would not be visible even in an electron microscope. Now, isn't it preposterous to think, at least I think it is, that this sub-microscopic speck someplace in the middle of Manitoba, think of all the specks of dust between Vancouver and Halifax, uh, 
that would be the only microscopic, submicroscopic speck of dust to have life on it, it would make us utterly, utterly, utterly special. I think it's, uh, it, would be, it would be statistically stupid to think that we are so special. Now let's take a look at the next slide, which represents a portion of our galaxy, just a small portion. Now if tomorrow, in some magic way, you were to take the sun and place it out at the average distance of these stars, you would not be able to tell the sun from any of these other dots. And as far as seeing the planets, that would be out of the question because they'd be completely insignificant. And this gives one a rather strange feeling. The sun could be that dot there, it could be that dot there, it could be that dot there. It gives me at least a strange feeling that I sort of wonder how many talks like this are going on elsewhere tonight. <laughs> and this is just a small portion of the stars of our galaxy. And if we now take a Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon or some spaceship and travel outward from the screen now at the speed of light, which is about 600 million miles an hour, travel straight out and travel that way for three million years and then look back, you'd see something like shown in the next slide. This is, of course, not our galaxy, but this is something what we would look like if we could get outside of ourselves and look as we are. This is probably the way we look to some other astronomer in some other galaxy. Now, this is one of the closer galaxies, only three million or so light years away, but uh, of course there are galaxies that are billions of light years away. And if this were our galaxy instead of someone, else, someone else's galaxy, then the sun would not be anywhere near the center, but the sun would be out here someplace in this haze. Uh, and going around the whole thing in some 200 million years. So I think you begin to see why the idea of life elsewhere in the universe is not only logical, but by all common sense reasoning, it seems idiotic for us to consider ourselves the highest intelligences in the universe. So uh, we can have the lights on temporarily again, or we can leave that on, it's a nice picture. Uh, where does this leave us? Well, all right, there are in, I think you'd have to say there undoubtedly are intelligences elsewhere in the universe. Does this or does this not have anything to do with UFOs? Well, I can argue like a debater. I can build up a good case for saying yes and a very good case for saying no. Let's take the case for saying no first. Uh, the distances in the universe are so great that it would be most unlikely by ordinary reasoning to expect anyone ever to find us because first of all the earth is inconsequential in size and you'd have to hunt pretty hard and carefully to find it if you did visit this part of the solar uh, this part of the galaxy and finally found our sun you'd probably examine Jupiter and Saturn, but you probably would miss the Earth and Venus. They would be inconspicuous. I would be much, much happier if we had only one UFO report every 100 or every 1,000 years, rather than hundreds or even thousands per year. And it doesn't make sense to me. Of course, there may be ways of arguing that around that. Uh, so, also, since the speed of light seems very definitely to be the limiting speed, and that we know no way of getting up to even with our technology, certainly in our technology, uh, it seems to be impossible. Um, the, however, if you want to argue the other side of the question, just for fun of it, as a sort of a mental exercise, let's, let's argue and, and uh, see what the other side of the coin might be. Uh, we can point out that, well, let me, let me put it this way. The, um, I like to sort of do a little science fiction here and uh, fantasize that suppose that someday 
the human race gets really smart enough to be really to go out and explore other stars and see if they have solar systems around them. Uh, what we would probably do rather than picking one star and then later, much later on picking another, we'd probably send a whole host of probes out into space uh, and send them just examining, circling around and reporting back to us maybe once every hundred or every thousand years to see what was going on. And when we found such a civilization or such a planetary system that had something interesting, then we might step up our surveillance of that particular system. So now let's put the shoe on the other foot. Let us first of all point out that there are stars that are millions of years older than the sun. And when we consider that in the last 100 and 150 years, look what's happened here on Earth. Uh, we've gone from the covered wagon to the 747 in uh, just about 150 years and gone from the Wright brothers and Kitty Hawk to the moon in just 70 years. Let us suppose we have the shoe on the other foot and some other civilization, much more advanced than we are, had maybe 500,000 years ago put such a probe into the solar system. It's going around and every thousand years reporting back to home base. Nothing new going on. The human race is still procreating and fighting wars. A thousand years later, the report, same thing, procreating and fighting wars. But all of a sudden, the last report, uh, since these reports are only a thousand years apart, would have had a different story. Suddenly, the human race has become interesting to intelligences elsewhere. In a relatively short time, they've gone, as I said, to this covered wagon in the 747 to the moon, gone to the space age, nuclear energy, computers, computers, m miniaturization, uh, medical progress, every field. I mean, if you were some disembodied intelligence or maybe embodied intelligence elsewhere, you wouldn't have paid much attention to the human race in the last many, many thousands of years, but now suddenly the human race has become interesting. In the same sense that if we made periodic visits to Australia, we wouldn't pay much attention to colonies of kangaroos, but if one day our report came back that the kangaroos had built a 747, we'd suddenly get interested in those kangaroos. Now, if you want to argue that way, I said it's, this is science fiction, if you wanted to argue that way, you could say that to some intelligences elsewhere, the human race has suddenly become interesting, and the surveillance has been stepped up, and that that's what UFOs are. I say this is science fiction. This is one possibility. Now, um, I lost my train of thought that I was going to make another point. But the, um, well, that's one way of looking at it, that, that the uh, human race has become interesting and uh, we are being investigated. Um, the other point that I was going to make will come back to me. I'm sure any notes with me. I'm just improvising. And when it does come back, I'll let you know. Uh, so in the meantime, let's go on to another question. And we'll... Any, uh, is that microphone alive now or not? What, what method of investigation... I don't want to say just I use, I mean the people associated with me, any good investigator I will generally, first of all, he should be an investigator and not a lecturer. He should not go out and try to tell people what they've seen or interpose his ideas on them. He should really be an investigator and listen to what they have to say and never ask leading questions. For instance, one never says, did it have sharp edges? You say, did it have sharp edges? Were the edges sharp or were they fuzzy? Or did it ever pass in front of something or did it pass in back of something? Now, there's always give them a choice. In, uh, and one thing that I frequently do is to uh, say, in recounting the thing, I'll say, uh, I'll deliberately make some misstatements. I'll say, um, and I'll, let me see if I got this straight. Then I'll repeat their story, but deliberately making one or two obviously incorrect statements. If they stop me and say, oh, no, no, that wasn't that way, it was this way, then that's a point in their favor. 
if they just let me go on, or isn't that what you meant? Oh, polygraph and hypnotism and things like that. Uh, yes, whenever possible. But very frequently, if a person, if you simply ask a person whether he is willing to take a polygraph test and point out that you have means of administering it, that uh, sometimes does almost as well. Because a person, if he says, no, no, I don't want to, and uh, then I'm a little suspicious. But if he says, yes, I'd be very happy to take a lie detector test, uh, then it depends on whether you've got a reliable one or, or not, uh, a reliable person to give it. Hypnotism is being used more and more in investigation in regressing people. Now, for instance, in the Charlie Hickson case, um, when I got down there with Dr. Harder, who did the hypnotism, uh, who did the hypnosis, I guess I should say, uh, Dr. Harder put Charlie under hypnosis and regressed him back to his fifth birthday party, and Charlie was able to tell us what presents he'd gotten on his fifth birthday, for instance. But when Dr. Harder tried to regress him to just two days earlier, to the time of the experience, Charlie, the perspiration broke out on his forehead, and he got very tense, and he just, he just didn't want to relive that experience. And um, so, uh, also, I was asked to go on the uh, Dick Cavett show with um, Charlie, and I insisted that he take a lie detector test first so that I wouldn't get the carpet pulled out from under me. I said I was going to mention this this afternoon, tonight, and so this is a good opportunity to do it. The, um, uh, also, Sheriff Diamond had left the uh, tape recorder going when Charlie and Calvin Parker were in the room and thinking they were alone and from the conversation they had between each other I could detect no sign of collusion that it was a fake in any way so I came to the conclusion that in this abduction case in Pascagoula, Mississippi the two fishermen that were taken aboard and given this examination uh, that it had been what was to them a real experience they were not lying but whether it was a real, real experience in some nuts and bolts, how do we know? Saul of Tarsus, on the way to Damascus, when he became St. Paul, on the way to becoming St. Paul, uh, had an experience. Was it a real experience? How do we know? What, is, what do we mean by real? That's why, incidentally, Jacques Vallée and, and I have entitled our latest book The Edge of Reality, because one is being sort of pushed to the edge of what we normally think of as reality. Uh, hypnotism, lie detectors, um, well, that's really about all. Uh, I generally try to have a psychologist who's used to personality quirks talk with the person and tell me whether he thinks this person has, has some troubles and also try to look into his past, see what uh, what he has, sort of a medical, what sort of a medical history he has, and so forth. But you can't pry too much into a person's private life; it becomes a little invasion of privacy, sort of thing. Well, I think we've kicked that, kicked that one around enough. Yes. Uh, well, uh, really, very few. Uh, percentage would be two or three percent. Is that very, that's that small. There, you've got to realize that to the to the people, it has been a very real experience. In fact, this is why the first book was called the UFO Experience. I could have probably sold many more copies if I'd called it the Sensuous UFO, or something like that. But it was the most honest title I could think of because what we are describing is what what the, the experience that the people say they've had. And on that level of experience, it is real. It's real to them. To make no mistake, it's just as real as day and night. Uh, yes? Uh, could I recall some of the most unusual cases we've come across? 
Were you here this afternoon? Yeah, well, you saw some of the ones that he had then. Uh, I should have brought uh, more notes. typical cop. In fact, he complained to me after it was all over that his whole experience had kept him from getting his quota of speeders that day. Uh, he's a burly, brusque sort of cop that I'd hate to get stopped by. And he was out, as you might expect, chasing a speeder out south of Socorro, New Mexico. When he saw, descending from the sky, an object and then a, large, a very loud noise. Since he knew there was a dynamite shack out in that area, he was afraid that something was wrong there, so he let the speeder go, which was out of, out of character for him. And he um, went off across the mesquite and over very, very rough terrain. And in the distance, he could see what at first he thought was an upturned, an, an automobile turned end on, like so. And he saw three white-clad figures around it. He then uh, radioed in, asking for help. And if it hadn't been for the fact that Sergeant Chavez was at the station then, on the way out, took the wrong turn, this thing would have been a two-witness case. Chavez arrived there shortly after the thing had disappeared. But before he arrived, uh, Zamora told me that now he went up and a sort of a hill hid the thing from sight until he got around the hill onto a sort of a mesa and there just about 75 feet in front of him let's make that 150 feet uh, was this object it was now a horizontal an egg-shaped object on four standing on four feet uh, actually and started to approach it. He started to approach. I, I went and he reenacted this whole thing with me. I always like to reenact the crime. I don't like to investigate cases in a person's living room, having them tell me what happened. I want to go right to the place where they say it happened, and preferably at the same time of day or night, and have them go through the thing. Well, we did this with Zamora, and he went through the case. He showed where, where his car, his patrol car, had been parked. He'd walked down toward the object. He was in sort of a gully. He was about a quarter way down when he heard a loud noise inside, and he thought the thing was going to explode. So he turned tail, and he went through the whole thing for me. He uh, ran up uh, as much as he could, and um, in going around the car just to seek protection, he hit his leg against the rear fender, and his glasses were sent sprawling around. And he continued on, and he showed me how he then crouched down and looking backward this way, shielding his eyes for thinking there'd be an explosion, he saw the thing slowly rise and then go horizontally down what he called Six Mile Canyon, and it was gone. Within two minutes, Sergeant Chavez showed up, and the first remarks that Chavez made to Lonnie Zamora was, Lonnie, what's the matter? You look like you've seen the devil. And Lonnie said, oh, maybe I have. And the first thing that Lonnie wanted to do was to go see his priest. Now, Chavez went down. Lonnie would not go down near there. But Chavez went down and told me he found four holes where the thing had ostensibly been resting. There were, some of the bushes were still smoldering. And we have pictures and casts and measurements and so forth of, of all that. Well, that is a case that has been it's a classic. It's never been disproved. And one that's occurred rather recently in Bergen, New Jersey. Uh, it occurred, well, it actually occurred last August. It's a very interesting story because the principal witness, there are two witnesses, completely independent, by the way. One of them is, uh, runs a liquor store. The 72-year-old man who runs a little competition there. Uh, liquor store in Greenwich Village and it's his practice 
at about midnight to sh shut down the store, stay an hour or two to do his books and so forth, and then he heads off to New Jersey, uh, and his path is the same. He always cuts across a little park, stops at an all-night delicatessen, picks up a couple of sandwiches, takes them to his brother's house, and they recount the day's events about three o'clock in the morning over some sandwiches. A horrible way of getting indigestion, but he's been doing it successfully. But this night, as he started to cut across the park, having been doing this night after night after night for years, he said that an, a brilliantly illuminated object came down, oh, he's over my left shoulder, meaning down over the car, landed in the park, and suddenly a ladder or something lowered, and eight or nine, he wasn't sure of an exact number, creatures came out, and it reminded him of, of a Marines taking a beachhead. Um, the, um, they came out very as though they had a job to do, came out with little instruments, dug holes, pulled the stuff out, put them into bags, got back aboard, and went off. The whole thing lasted only a few minutes. Well, he was so scared that he didn't bother stopping the delicatessen store that night, and he said he went right home and pulled the covers over his head. Uh, these things have to... The trouble with reading about UFO reports in magazines and so forth, they, the people aren't real, you know, life and flesh, life and blood creatures. They, they, they look like, you know, somebody that you found in a telephone book or something like that. But when you actually go out and interrogate people and you see this living flesh and blood person in front of you, uh, obviously in his, as far as you know, in good sense, in, in, in control of himself, telling you these incredible stories, Time and again, I've said to myself, well, why is this person here telling me this incredible tale? Surely he must think that I may think he's a complete nut, but they still go ahead and, and tell it anyway. But what happened here then is that he went back the next day and found the holes. And he said, you know, it's just, it was just like when you pinch yourself to see whether you're awake. He said, when I put my hand in those holes, he said it was the whole reality of the thing came back to him. There were the holes. Well, at the same time, the night before when this was going on, there is across the park, uh, the park is not a large one, it's just a small little park, but at the edge of the park, you might really call it a parklet, uh, there is an, an apartment house, a very fancy apartment house called the Stonehenge Apartments. And, um, sort of a large circular sort of thing with very nice uh, big picture windows in the first floor. That's important. The night guard was on, the, the doorman, night doorman was on duty and he looks over to this, toward the park and suddenly sees, and the times agree by the way, sees this very bright light coming down. He did not see the creatures, he was too far away to see the creatures, but he saw the light he runs over to pick up the telephone to call the police. At that time, his front big picture window shatters. The times agree. So what do you do with a case like that? The people are of... Uh, there are no, uh, no great shakes in intellectual prowess, but they, all the indications are that they're completely honest. They had no possible reason for making up a story, and they did not know each other. This uh, doorman, in fact, had ceased being the doorman. There was a new doorman, but only because the investigator was very good with Ted, Ted Blocher, was persistent. He found out the address of the former doorman, trailed him to where he now lives in New Jersey, and didn't tell him about the other fellow at all, and got this other story. So there is a, there is a good example of a, a weird case, an incredible case, with independent witnesses. You finally come to the point that you've got to make the choice of saying, well, either all these people are liars or fools or something is going on. And I have had to come to the conclusion in my own thinking that something is really going on. Yes? Well, these occurred long after the Condon report. Uh, the, the Condon report would... would be the subject of a, a lecture in itself. But I think everybody should read the Condon Report if they can get it, because it's a darn good report. If uh, you make sure that you read it backwards, 
you must not read and then stop with the summary in the front part which is written by Dr. Condon. I think it's a little blasphemous perhaps or not blasphemous but not uh, um, properly respectful of the dead perhaps but I honestly don't believe that Condon ever read the full report uh, because he and this is not just my own opinion but the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics appointed a committee to look at the Condon report and Dr. Sturrock at Stanford also made a separate review and they both came to the same conclusion that Condon's, Dr. Condon's summary did not reflect the contents, the full contents of the report. If you really read the report from cover to cover, you will see, first of all, you'll see that a third of the cases were never solved. Many of the cases that were included, I would never have included to begin with because they were obviously lens flares or balloons. I, I wouldn't have wasted any time on it. The really interesting cases, they did not solve. So, it constantly, and in the course that I'm now teaching at Northwestern on UFOs, the Condon Report is required reading. They, they investigated a total, I think, of 91 reports all told. Some would be called good at that time. They didn't inv investigate the Socorro case, they wanted current cases. They, at the time that they were investigating, there was a whole big wave of, of UFO sightings going on in Spain, but they didn't want to s take anything but U.S. reports. So they very they limited their their sample. But despite that, it's still a good report. Yeah, the question is, the comment is that haven't. Uh, hasn't the Condon Report turned off a lot of people? That is the common statement. I will uh, say if I go someplace and people will say, well, but that, that's cert certainly been settled. The Condon Committee settled all that. The Condon Committee, or Condon, not the Condon Committee, because uh, there was a minority report, very definitely. The, um, um, the Condon Report, or Condon's own report essentially was an attempt to give a half million dollar burial to the subject but the subject certainly didn't stay buried in fact it was because the Condon committee made that decision and the, you, the Air Force used that to get out of the thing and when the big wave of sightings occurred in 1973 in the United States and the southern southeastern states especially just nobody was minding the store there was no one to do anything about it. And that is the time that the Center for UFO Studies was formed. I might as well tell you very briefly that story because I think it's interesting. For many years, uh, people like Jacques Vallée and I and uh, Saunders and many others had been meeting more or less privately, clandestinely, to discuss uh, the UFO situation, but not openly. And we sort of jokingly called ourselves the Invisible College. That is a very honorable term. Uh, honorable history because way back in the 17th century when scientists themselves were suspected of being suspected of being in league with the devil they had to um, uh, meet in back rooms of taverns and go down dark alleys to discuss their experiments and they called themselves the invisible college and it wasn't until Charles II in 1666 I believe it was uh, created the Royal Society in England that science became respectable and then the Invisible College could become visible. And so, in 1973, we decided that our Invisible College should become visible, and we created the Center for UFO Studies. Now, that's a rather long statement. I'm going to try to make my answers much, much shorter. Yes? Oh, for heaven's sakes, yes. Uh, let me give you one. In fact, when I started this thing, as a, I don't know, could I have a show of hands of how many were here this afternoon? There's quite a few that weren't. So maybe I could very briefly, very briefly recount how I got into this thing. You, you weren't here, were you? Well, then maybe it's part of the answer. Uh, I got into this not in spite of the fact that I was an astronomer, but because I was an astronomer. I happened to be the handiest astronomer to Dayton, Ohio at the time, and the Air Force needed an astronomer to help them see how many of the cases could be 
Uh, can we go to back to the very first, uh, I think it's the very first slide, or very close to the very first one, number one or so. Um, way back, you'll have to switch it to, that's it, fine. This was the first page of a report, or the summary page of a report I turned into the Air Force in 1949. Now I can finally use this thing. My job with the Air Force, which started in 1948, was to see how many of the cases could be described astronomically. And you see about a third, if you stretch things, could be called astronomical. Let me give you one example of one of the astronomical ones. Someone had reported a mother ship and four baby ships. It turned out to be Jupiter and its four satellites. Now, my job ended here, really. I could have disregarded the rest of it, but I was sort of curious, and so I looked at the other things. You see, non-astronomical, but suggestive of other explanations, balloons, aircraft, rockets, flares, and so forth. And then there was a certain number here. Lack of evidence precludes explanation. And... Uh, but look at 3B, evidence offered suggests no explanation, only 20%, or one out of five. And that holds still today. When you look and somebody tells you about a UFO, or you read about it in the newspaper, really the chances are still four out of five that it is a explainable. Now, some of you may be aware that the Air Force said that uh, it wasn't 20%, but they, they explained everything but two or 3%. Well, they did their statistics in a most amazing and amusing way. At the, they were a light. Well, aircraft have lights. Therefore, they would say probable aircraft or possible aircraft or probable balloon or possible balloon and so forth. At the end of the year, when the statistics were gathered, those little words, probable and possible, were dropped. Even a possible aircraft became an aircraft. And that is how they got there. I was there, I, I saw it. I used to argue with them uh, that this was not good statistics. Oh, they said, we can't have that many different categories. In the middle, you know, you know, if you look in the dictionary, and some dictionaries anyway, under intelligence, you'll find three listings, human, animal, and military. <laughs> So I think that answers your question. There are many, many, the four-fifths of the cases were explained. So uh, in fact, I used to, before, uh, before I finally began to take the thing seriously, I regarded it as, uh, I sort of kept a scoreboard, box score. And every time that I could knock down a case, that was one score for the home team, so to speak. Uh, how about, uh, let's see, what, uh, yes, how about you, then? The star map, the Betty Hill Marjorie Fish star map. You uh, want to uh, say something? Or? Uh, I was just going to ask for questions at the microphone. Oh, uh, why don't you ask questions at the microphone? Okay. Uh, I was just going to ask for questions at the microphone. Uh, people can't hear when questions are being asked in the audience, and uh, it, it requires Dr. Hynek to to uh, repeat the question or something like that. And also, uh, uh, before Dr. Hynek answers the question now, uh, during dinner, Dr. Hynek suggested that if anybody uh, has had any observations of uh, what uh, he classifies as contacts, close contacts of, of uh, any sort, and are willing to relate them, that uh, uh, he'd be very willing to listen and uh, uh, talk about them. Apropos of that, uh, let me, if you mind my holding your question for a bit, because this brings up that point. I think it is uh, anyone's, I would hold, anyone's scientific duty to report what they consider is a truly valid case. And now, the cases, the kinds of reports, fall into fairly definite patterns. And roughly, I've classified them as the nocturnal lights, the strange lights seen in the night sky that don't have any normal explanation, 
the daylight discs, the radar cases, and then the three kinds of close encounters. A close encounter is a case in which the person says they've seen their object, the object or apparition, say within a few hundred feet, really close by. And I've divided those into three kinds, those that are close but nothing really happens, those that leave a mark on the ground, such as holes or broken tree branches or uh, stopped engines or animals affected or temporary paralysis of a person or temporary blindness and so forth. And then the third kind, those in which creatures, occupants, euphonauts, call them what you will, are reported. Now, there's nothing much can be done about the nocturnal lights. So a person has seen a light in the night sky, it may be very strange, but you, you sort of finally have to say, well, so what? Nothing much can be done about it. But we are particularly interested in the close encounters. So if anyone here has had seen something close by, uh, that is, should be reported. Now, I, I know people are sometimes very reluctant to report those things, but I can assure you that the center operates like a doctor's office. Uh, names of people are never used without their permission, and uh, because there's no point to that. We want the scientific facts, and the name is in itself of no great importance. Now, if uh, could I then ask for a show of hands here, first of all, how many people, either themselves or have a close member in the family or a close friend whose veracity they can trust uh, have had what they thought was a UFO experience. Could we have a show of hands on that? Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Uh, okay, say 24, I think I missed one, maybe 25. Now, of those, how many were close encounters in the sense that they were, oh, let's be generous, say within a thousand feet? Can I have sh now a show of hands? One, one thousand feet, yeah. Half a mile, that wouldn't count as a, a half a mile would no longer count as a close encounter, unless it was so big that you could see a great deal of detail. Uh, how many, uh, who, who raised their hands on the, on the close encounter that could? Uh, you did, and uh, two there, three, four, five, six. Would you be willing to um, report that in writing to me? Would you, any of you be willing, now in this friendly audience, to give us a quick synopsis of what you saw? It's very, it's sometimes embarrassing to do that, but why don't you come up to the microphone here, because, or a microphone over there. Well, there's, I think it works, and if it does, it's fine. That doesn't work. It will. It will. Try it now. Better come up front. We need, we need to. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, now, uh, some of you can have some some uh, questions of, of him and see whether let's see whether we can solve this problem. Let, let's see whether we can find a natural explanation. It wasn't me, but it was a friend of mine. He uh, was on a farm, and he happened to be out with his girlfriend that night, and they're out in the country. And they're sitting in a truck, and a saucer landed. Get, get closer to the mic. And a saucer landed in the field, oh, about 2,000 yards away or so. So they were sitting there looking at it, and a creature got out of the saucer and walked around and was starting to walk toward the truck. So he got out and he started to walk towards the creature and it ran back to the saucer, got in and it took off and it landed. Uh, it saucer took off and it landed in the other field oh, on the other side of the truck where they sat there for a while. 
he said about half an hour, and then it took off and flew away. Now, um, has that was that reported officially to anybody? It was reported to officially because the RCMP from Ottawa came down and they took reports from who came down? The RCMP. Oh, the RCMP came down. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And you don't know what they did with the report, though. I don't know what they did. Mm -hmm. with did they? Did they? Uh, did the RCMP take it seriously, or did they think it was a bunch of well, junk? Well, it must have been because it came down from Ottawa to see him. Uh huh. All right. Uh, do you have a written account of it any place? No. Would you be willing to write it up? I'd be briefly? willing to ask him to write it up for you. Yeah. All right. Would you? And uh, if we can find the uh, in the slides here, there's one slide there that has the address of the Center for UFO Studies. Uh, why don't we rather quickly go through these slides. What we did here this afternoon, I'm not going to go through it again, but very, very briefly, we, were, we started out by talking about some of the IFOs, things that are mistakes that are sometimes regarded as UFOs. Here's a searchlight, the next one. This is a lenticular cloud, next one. Uh, double exposure, next. An astronomical thing. The full moon, a fake, I mean, an a out of focus photograph of a banana split Sunday. <laughs> now we'll, we'll go, uh, this was the case in Saskatchewan, let's uh, keep through that. Uh, the guy, the witness thought he saw a duck blind, but it turned out that it was a rapidly rotating a metal disc and when he went back uh, and got back on his tractor and looked around the next slide he saw uh, four others arranged like that they were all spinning and they rose up and then they arranged themselves in the line north and south and then they went up through the clouds and were gone and these po photographs were taken by the RCMP the next day where each one of those things had been there was a grass ring of grass matted down in that manner and the next slide shows two of them close together you saw in the diagram maybe and uh, this this one we'll pause on because um, it's so characteristic and this furthermore it's one that I investigated closely myself this was in the center of uh, Iowa in a large soybean field and the reported UFO had left this 40 foot uh, destroyed mess in the soybean field. The plants were not crushed, anything like that, but they were, well, as I said this afternoon, they looked to me as though they had been placed in a microwave oven. And uh, there we found no explanation of, of this at all. There was no obvious uh, anybody coming in there and doing that. Next, um, well, we went quickly through to show how the subject has been ridiculed those who were here this afternoon will please bear with me with that in mind. Uh, I pointed out that we were not laughing at the subject, but I was demonstrating how the subject has been laughed at and what has prevented real scientific work from being done because of the ridicule curtain. Um, next. Next. Somehow I pictured my first ride in a UFO rather differently, in a flying saucer rather differently. Don't look up Roscoe, it only encourages them. <laughs> we come in peace and bring bright trinkets. I just shook his hand and he was sick. <laughs> now hold this one. Because this is the, uh, those of you who have or know someone who has had a sighting, please copy down this uh, address if you can, uh, it's, or send it to me, the Department of Astronomy at Northwestern University. And um, these, the center exists for three purposes. One is to do scientific work on the subject. One is to uh, receive reports with the assurance that the person's name will not be used and they will not be ridiculed. And the third and a very important one is an educational one. One of those, these last two slides of the 
I was seduced by a flying saucer and a flying saucer saved my virginity, sort of things, uh, il illustrates how many people, especially kids today, have to get their information about UFOs. I get lots of letters from kids in high school and grammar school saying, I'm doing a special report on UFOs. Please send me all the information you have. Uh, would they, instead of, they, they have to go to the tabloids and to the pulp magazines and things like that to get the information. There should be some real source of good, solid information. And that's what the center is trying to do. And as I said this afternoon, I'm going to say it again. One of the things that I hope will result from my visit here and later in the month to Toronto is that a similar coalition of serious investigators in Canada will take place and there will be a center a Canadian Center for UFO Studies, which will cooperate, I hope, with the United States organization.